It's in our boat. It's our responsibility. If we want it, and if we're ready to press there, we will get it. But if we give up, then it won't happen. There was something else that was said during the prayer. He said, we were in a season of wrestling. In that season of wrestling, the result is not always immediate because God wants to see if we'll be persistent to wrestle until we see that result. And I believe that our greatest time of wrestling, forgive me for feeling this way, is that 6 to 8 a.m. prayer. I really believe that's super important. And uh, I saw a little bump, and I saw it go up above 30. And now it's dipped down around 20, 22. And, and, and we can't have those dips because this is our season of wrestling. Amen? This is our season of striving. So if you've become part of it and you've kind of faded off because it didn't produce that immediate result, it's not going to produce that immediate result. This is a season of wrestling. I'm telling you, that's a word. That's a rhema word right there. He said, he, he said, you know, if you're sensitive to the Spirit, you can tell when I'm praying and when I'm prophesying. And he was prophesying during that time. That we are in a season of wrestling and saints, it is time to wrestle. You know why churches fail? Because we wrestle not, period. But it is a season of wrestling not against flesh and blood. We can't afford not to wrestle. And we wrestle from a position of victory. Don't get me wrong, but there is a real enemy. He says we are more than conquerors. Jesus didn't argue with the devils. He didn't have a struggle with them. He said, come out. And they came out. They had no choice but to respond. And that's where God wants to take us. But we're in a season of wrestling. And we've got to wrestle together. Or in Kentucky, wrestle, whatever you want to call it. This is our season. This is our time. If you came uh, prepared to give, then we're going to give you an opportunity to do just that. Remember, I've challenged you to always come before the king with some kind of a gift. So even if it's just a dollar, even if it's just an old, an old George, you know, uh, God can turn Georges into, into bins. Amen? It says up to 100-fold, does it not? Amen? So I'm asking God to change my Georges into Ben's because, uh, you know, I've got some needs coming up that uh, I don't have enough Georges for yet. But I tell you what, my daddy owns all the cows. And he's done sold a couple. Amen. So, Father, right now, I lift this up before you and I ask you to use it to multiply. Lord, I don't give to get. I give because you are worth it. I give because you are worthy. And, Lord, but I do thank you that when I give, there are principles in heaven that meet earth. And it can change our financial situation. And we give you glory for that. In Jesus' name, can you sure say amen? amen? Praise God. Dr. Robinson, it's all yours. Good evening. Andrew, why don't you come up front? Um, Caleb, right next to you. Those bags, the one, the one that's in the bag, the cone. That. Pass that around. There's that one. Yes. This one. Did come up. Okay. All right. So this uh, kind of big clay tapered shape with a mushroom head on it is called a, um, a couple different names. It's called a foundation peg or a foundation cone or a clay nail. There's a whole bunch of shapes. But it has some cuneiform writing on the side, just something imprinted it into the clay, typically with a stick or some sort of shaped marker. Uh, and these were made and then baked, dried and then baked. Uh, when I say baked, you know, it's uh, pottery, so this is like a thousand, well over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then stuck into the walls of a building to serve as evidence that the temple or place was property of the gods. Um, and they, would, they, they were also metal versions uh, and some castings. But uh, these would be particularly used with uh, mud brick buildings, although actually something this big stuck in the corners between a, uh, bricks, it, that, that could be worked, but it's actually a almost a little awkward. It really would work better with wattle and daub, just mud uh, buildings, or um, I forget the other type, but there, there's... Anyway. Uh, it, with mud, with mud buildings, it, it would work perfectly because then you could just place it anywhere, anywhere you wanted to without, and it would stand out. 
No, we're going to save the last part till next week. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wanted you to know about that because you're going to hear it again next week. We're going to hear about these cones again. There's only be three weeks in a row that you've heard about the cones. All right? So tonight I'm getting to a very, um, this is a difficult lesson for me because I hate to even talk about it. because I know who the Lord is and I can't stand the idea of man taking away or trying to take away his glory. So the scripture says, the earth of the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even lift them up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. We're living in a confused state right now. This generation has so much going against it. Um, they're filling their heads many, many ways with a lot of empty rhetoric. And um, a lot of it is being poured out of the mouths of those who should know better. But they're pouring it into them. So what I found out by dealing with this new breed of people is that they want the truth. They want the raw truth. Don't give me a bunch of mess. Just give me the truth. But we are sometimes blinded in our nation and in our, our quest for the things that are much better. We are blinded by the flattery of those who can speak, by those who are flamboyant, and those who have strange behavior. And so some of those are the most prominent members of our society. And we will follow them, not considering the consequences. So we prefer sometimes the myths to truths. And we prefer maybe to be exact. It is not considered right. If it is not considered right by a particular group of people, then they're telling us that we are wrong. Okay? God did not make us all the same. And he did not make us all exactly alike. We don't think alike. That is why he gave us such wonderful gifts. And it pr proves that he is requiring something different from each one of us. Even if we say that we are not, we are very unique individuals. This is why some of us are drawn to each other. If not, there would be a physical attraction there, but a kindred spirit that attracts us to each other. A Christian knows another Christian. A person who is not a Christian knows another person like them. You know, you'll watch people who will try to feel you out and say certain things just to see where you are. So you have to be very careful of what they say. And they love to use catchphrases that will blow your mind away, and they're so simple. And the main one is, what if? Okay? They will hit you with that quite often. What if? And we'll hear it sometimes so much that we will start to wonder ourselves, hmm, what if this is true? So they will ask you questions like this. What if, what if there is no God? What if that we, uh, there is another parallel universe? What if we were made by aliens? What if we are the product of evolution? After all, with no hope of anything else other than to be evolved into something else weird. What if we are wrong about the beginning of time? What if there's no right or wrong? What if we have been taught the wrong things all these years? And the question what if keeps going on and on and on to the point where you start to think in your own mind, maybe I have been believing in the wrong stuff. And the people who've been teaching me all along, they've been kind of wishy-washy about what they've been saying. But you got to be careful about that because what if can throw you off. It's great to be curious, but you got to know when it's to draw the line. And sometimes we don't know how 
to draw the line. When you get to this point, your enemy assumes that he has control over you, and that enemy is Satan. He's the one who's putting all these questions in your head, and he knows how to push the right buttons. So what is the God particle? Man has been searching for the beginning forever. He's searching for the origin of life. So the main questions I ask, where did I come from, or where do we all come from? So we ask again, are we alone in the universe? Do we have a counterpart in another universe that looks just like us? How many of you have asked that as a child? I wonder if somebody else looks just like me, you know? Okay. And then sometimes people will walk up to you and say, you look just like, you know? And you start to think, well, maybe there is a counterpart to me. And they're here from aliens brought them in and sat them in. Okay? All right. But then you have to think about the questions that they're asking you and the questions that you're asking. Seriously, there is a gap between religion and science, but sometimes science says there isn't. But there is a definite gap. When I look at the question that Einstein asked, what were God's thoughts when he made the universe? Right there, that should have clicked in the scientist's head. This is a man who's been dealing with nothing but science all of his life, looking for the meaning, and he goes back to God. He even asked the question, what were God's thoughts? Not man's, not an alien, but what were God's thoughts? But they didn't catch it. They didn't catch it when he said that. So what do they do? They draw their own conclusion. And what do they do if they look at how we are made, our makeup, what are we? They reduce us to little tiny particles. That's what they're seeing us as now. Dots, dashes, whatever. Little swirly lines, whatever they want to call it. That's what they're seeing us as. They break us down to the tiniest molecule and tell us this is what we are. And try to tell us that they have infinite wisdom when we know there's only one who does have it. Science have decided that there must be something greater out there, something even more that they can find in their research. They have to reach, and they have to cause, it causes life on this planet. And they will continue to study and do so until they find the answer. Now, what is the God particle? The God particle is a mass of energy that exploded to create the universe. It is considered the precise moment that gives the answer to what happened before in the beginning, the true beginning of time. In 1964, there was a man by the name of Peter Higgs who came up with an idea of how the universe was formed. And he broke every living thing down to these molecules, to protons and so forth. And then he set out to break it down into subatomic uh, uh, particles. And he was piggybacking off of a Greek scientist from around the year 1000, well, 100, I'm sorry, the year 100 CE. And his name was Democritus. Um, he's claiming that breaking these things down was the beginning of life. They keep moving God out of the picture. And that makes me angry. Because who are we to move him out of the picture? Even though scientists have worked hard to try to prove their point, they have yet to answer the question, how did life begin? So... What they're saying is that we as Christians, we as believers in a God, one God, uh, we have a problem. They said we should be more like scientists. But then we have the religious people, as they call us, telling us, telling them, you need to be more like us. Because the answer is right in front of your face, but you won't look at it and see it. So they do believe in one thing that they have found in the Bible. And they will say Genesis 1 and 1 through 3. That's correct, because they believe in the one Jesus. When God said, let there be light, there is light, there was light. And that was, to them, the Big Bang Theory, okay? The great Big Bang. But guess what? They're lying to themselves, because they have already said that is not the proper explanation for that. They've already said that the Big Bang couldn't happen until all the stars and things start to move. Everything that flew out from the, Jesus saying, God saying, let there be light. So then they've already uh, put a lie on themselves. How can you say 
that this is the Big Bang when it was just light, but yet there were no stars, no moon, no anything, no galaxies, nothing. The Big Bang comes when the Lord tells them to fill the sky. When he speaks that, that's the Big Bang. Then you see everything fill in the sky, everything, everything that we are so concerned with, so we are so curious about, about in space. He fills space with his words. The comparison has been made to the Bible by other religions as well because all of them have a starting point. They seem to know that there's something at the beginning and before that beginning came, there was a dark matter, okay? So you look at some of them, what they're saying compared to our Bible and we actually we all agree because there was a beginning, okay? It was just that it wasn't their beginning. We had the only beginning, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, our Father who created the universe, okay? So now let's talk about CERN. I wish I had my, you got the, okay, okay, thank you. Let's leave that right there for the time being. Um, CERN is a large hadron collider. Now you say, what in the world is that? Okay, it's a giant machine. It is a huge machine. And there's more than one of them in the world, but let it stay there, don't touch it, okay. <laughs> um, this machine is 17 miles round and is deep in the earth, 575 feet. And what it is known as the most powerful particle collider and the strongest machine, and it's very powerful in the world, and it was built by the nuclear organization in Europe, and it's called CERN. And it started in 1954, um, but it didn't really come into play that we will actually understand it until about the year two of 1998. By, by 2008, it was up and functioning. Its whole purpose was to seek out who made the universe, to find that God particle so that they could say that they were more powerful than what man is. So they planned to do this by smashing two protons together to cause this explosion to happen. And they played a video, made it, taped it, so they could see it when it came back together, so they could actually see how it happened. And then they could have a picture of what happened. And you could see for themselves, you can say they can point and say, see, that's where it happened. That's how the so-called God made the universe, okay? But in the process of doing this, they got even greedier. They don't only want to see how the process was made. They want to go back farther than that. As one scientist said, he says, we want to go back before the beginning so that we can see for ourselves who made the beginning. So they, have, they shut the thing down for a while. We're going to get to that in a minute. Um, so that they could bring it back up, and they did it again this year. And they call it now the theory of everything, because they figured this time, with the more power that they've given it, that uh, it's going to give them a whole lot more power to see what was in the dark matter. Bring that in. So one of the two things they wanted to find it, are we alone in the universe? That's the first thing. And if so, are we have, do we have parallel universes? Uh, what is going to happen? They just want to know and they want to rule out anything to do with God, but they say, even after they finish with their work, if there is the God, then they, you know, they'll find him. He can have it. But other than that, they're going to keep searching. Okay? All right. I know it's dumb. CERN is not the only um, accelerator, as we want to sometimes call them, in the world. There are a number of them around the world. But the second largest one is right here in America, and we're not living that far from it. It's in Illinois. Part of it is in Batavia, Illinois. Um, many, many years ago, I used to be a part of an organization that helped people who were persecuted, in, uh, persecuted Christians and so forth and in their countries. And uh, we were having a meeting one night, and two of the men who had been coming to the meeting and wanted to join the organization, uh, we found out while we were sitting there um, that they were working 
at Fermilab. That's the particle accelerator here in the United States. And when we start to question them about what they were doing, and they told us they were physicists who worked there. And they were looking, they were searching for God. Okay, so we said, what do you mean? Well, we really don't truly believe there is a God, and we figure we can find the answer there at this place. Okay. We said, how can you search for God when you don't even know who he is? What are you looking for? And so instead of doing the work we were supposed to be doing that night, it was a very heavy debate. Because the area that I lived in, most of the people in the room were Christians. Um, we only, and we also lived in a community where there's a huge Christian college. So some of the faculty members were in the, in the group also there, and you couldn't get through to these two guys because their heads were so far above the clouds. And we were so little on their totem pole because we believed in a God that we could not see. So we pointed out, uh, you believe in something that you can't see yet. And you say it's there. So what's wrong with us believing in a God that we can't see? But that night, I left, you know, really bewildered by what I'd heard. And uh, I started not to go back. But then my focus had to go back to the people we were trying to help and who needed our help. And that's how I saved myself from that. Um, I was able to talk to them, but not always in the same way. It was something different about the conversation because you knew that they were always talking down to you because we weren't, we weren't intelligent enough to understand that there was really no God. It's only what man can find in space, okay? So anyway, we have to look at the arrogance of man and how he find, tries to find the things that he wants. So let's step back in time a little bit. And that's why you see that picture you see up there. And that is a Hindu god, Natajara. And what he's known as a dancing Shiva. And his problem is, is that he is the main god, one of the main gods, a god of destruction and fertility. And what he says, according to the Hindu people, is that if he says that if you have to die, then you have to die. And that means that you've got to move out of the way so something can come and replace you. Okay. So what CERN did was to take this statue and put it in front of their complex. And it means that you have, they represents them getting rid of the old to replace it with the new. Okay. Now the next one in my calendar. And, Caleb, would you pass that? It's heavy. What's getting ready to be passed around to you now is the Mayan calendar, okay? Okay, that's a humongous thing right there. Let me see if I can get that. All right, you'll be seeing something here on the wall, and I'm going to bring it to you. Um, when we used to look out at this, you remember we had a movie here not too long ago called 2012. It's okay, you can leave that there. It's okay. Yeah, that's okay. And movie was talking about the end of time using the Mayan or Aztec calendar. Remember that? And people were losing their mind in 2012 because they knew, everybody knew what the Mayan calendar had said and that they thought that this was going to be the end of time in 2012. All right? Okay. What happened was the Mayan clock was going to stop. Yes. And when it did stop, it says that something would have to change. It would be a dramatic change, some kind of cataclysmic change that was going to take place in the universe. Now, this clock has been used for many, many years in the past. And the most times, which time the clock ran down and it was stopped, something did change. It was always something bad. Well, here in 2012, it was not the end of time like they thought. That's why some people sold everything they had and went and stood up on mountains and went to the foot of pyramids and laid down waiting to die because they knew, <laughs> gosh, they knew that this was going to happen. I'm sorry, that part is funny, okay? But it didn't come to that. What actually happened in 2012, the clock did run down, the Mayan clock did run down, and that was the year that the Hadron Collider smashed two protons together 
and the explosion that resulted uncovered the new particle called the God particle in year 2012. So we are living now in an area of time that is a dangerous one. But one, we have to look at how they are, this, these things are working together and how they're working against us at the same time. First of all, as Christians, we're not prayed up. So we don't have a fortification around us that we should have. But we should be prayed up and know the word of God and what it means. So we go to Ezekiel 1. A lot of times when people read the first chapter of Ezekiel, they think it's this crazy stuff. But it's not. All right? The wheel in the middle of a wheel, those angels, those unique creatures, their purpose was to protect the throne of God. That's why any way you looked, it would, they, they would move that way. You move over, your truck, you can't get to the throne. You got to come by the right way, okay? So don't even think about it. Do it the right way. When we see the Mayan calendar, it is made a wheel in the middle of a wheel. When you see it go around, it's made in the wheel in the middle of a wheel. And that is just like the wheel that they were speaking of in the book of Ezekiel. Not only that, when we see the Hadron Collider, you see a picture of it. The Hadron Collider is also a wheel in the middle of a wheel. That's it right there. Isn't that something? It's an imitation of what the scripture says. Now the funny thing about this is that they claim that they don't believe in the Bible. Yes, they go there and try to pull from it to use to build what they want. So the wheel in the middle of a wheel means that they can get to the throne of God because there is nothing now separating them from the throne. Okay? All of the pictures that you see of this collider, that is it. The ring in the ground. One part of it is in France and the other part is in Switzerland. Now, one of the reasons we got into the conversation that night at the, at the meeting was because the one in the, um, the Fermilab, um, the government had already started to increase it so it could be the largest one in the world. They took, the, one of the men who was there was very angry because they had taken their family homeland, eminent domain they call it, and they took their farm. Farm had been in the family 146 years. Passed on from one generation to the other. And the government came and took it and said they were going to increase Fermilab. Fermilab is not as large, but it's there. And they, um, the government spent a million dollars digging the hole, and then they changed their mind. And then they took another million dollars to cover the hole up. <laughs> okay? So this man said, our farm could still be in our property. You know, it could be in our family. But if you should ever go to Batavia, Illinois, uh, if you drive through Batavia, you're right next to Fermilab, and you'll be able to see it. You cannot miss it from the road because it has a very unique structure that's sitting there. It's very tall. It's in the middle of the farmland. Many other scientists who work there also live there. Okay? But this is the Hadrian uh, Collider. We have to learn one thing, that we are children of God. And there is hope because he is going to watch out for us as long as we continue to lean on him. We've got to lean on him and learn who he is. We are not dumb. We're not stupid. We're not led by aliens. We have the DNA of the Lord God Almighty in us, which makes us superior to any of the any foolishness that can be put in front of us on this earth. So I ask you now to remember to bow to the Almighty God. And leave these other things alone. Don't let them trick you into believing these things. Because the world is trying to pull you away from him. Remember who your creator is. Remember him. Don't give him up for anybody. Lean on the Lord. No matter when it's even when it seems like it's not possible to do it anymore. Lean on him. He's the only one who can open your eyes and show you the truth. And he will not mislead you. Follow his path even when it's strange. 
and you should be excited about it when it's strange because that means you're going to have a good time. All right? He's not dull by any means. So read, study, learn who he is. And then next week, we're going to do something very special because I'm going to talk about the sound of music and it's coming from the Van Allen belt, so they claim. Well, we're going to talk about where music is everywhere. All right? All right. God bless, Pastor. But what's really interesting about CERN and all that's going on there and the God particle is really they're just trying to prove we can do the same thing you claim your God can do. And then it's almost like a taunt to put that Apollyon false God in the front. It's saying we're going to put something that's represented as God's enemy up here. It's almost like a dare. Um, Dr. Norman, did you say you saw a nuclear something going off? Was it in Illinois some years ago? It was like maybe last year? Was it Illinois? Because I, I thought it was in Illinois, which is interesting because that, that kind of is nuclear in a sense. Because when you go to splitting atoms and things like that, it can, boy, it can have a dramatic impact. But I just wonder if maybe that's what you were seeing. One of the things you may have seen, uh, people have claimed, one of the reasons why they claim aliens are around the, these places is because when sometimes when they set off these colliders, um, there's a, a, a light that comes up out of them, out of the ground and it's actually sending a signal somewhere else. And so it will look like you just, you know, stepped out of a sci-fi movie. Uh, don't let that fool you either, but the, <laughs> the place they're sending the signal to is in, I think, North Dakota. Because there's another one up there is where they send the signal to. But when it comes up out of the ground, it's a light that flows up out of the ground when that thing is heated up, okay? Can you imagine 17 miles around and all of that light is coming up out of the ground? They always go crazy in Europe when it goes off. Praise God. What's, what's interesting about science is it discovers something and then it makes it its pursuit to eliminate God. But that's not always been the purpose of science. Before the scientific revolution, scientists used science as a means to discover creation and try to understand God. After the scientific revolution, Nietzsche said that we've killed God. Well, he was wrong. Um, but it's, it's just interesting how science, uh, Stephen Hawking, if you've, if you've heard of him, he, he died recently. And I believe he's a believer now. But... Uh, the problem is it's too late. Um, but he felt that he eliminated God because the universe was a perfect equation, therefore it didn't need any tinkering. And I was like, but who set the equation? Who put it in place? It's, um, you know, God's the ultimate mathematician. He's the ultimate, ultimate physics, physicist. He put all these laws in motion. So um, it's, it's just fascinating to me how science discovers, like the, back when the Big Bang was initially a theory, it was actually a Christian bishop that uh, announced this theory. I cannot remember his name to save me. Um, it started with an F, I think. But um, he announced this theory because he was excited because it proved the universe had a beginning. And it affirmed Genesis chapter 1. That is all the Big Bang Theory is, is that the universe had a beginning point And something happened. And, and I, I love that you pointed out that God created light first. because he cre And I think he created light before the sun for several reasons. And one of them is to, to prove that he stands outside of science but also because he knew people would worship the sun. If he so if he created the sun first, it would give validity to that. So he created light independently from the sun and vegetation independently from the sun. Um, it's pretty incredible that God put, put laws in motion before he even put the things that made the laws happen in place. It's, it's pretty incredible. Right, we're going to stand. Very fascinating lesson tonight, Dr. Robinson. Good job. That was awesome. Um, I'm sure the Google will be on fire tonight as we all go home. <laughs> uh, Google will be like, why is there a sudden interest in CERN? And uh, look, don't go to the weird places. Can I tell you, don't go to the weird places. God gives you revelation, and then there's weird people that get a hold of it and take it to weird places. Don't go to the weird places. Um, stick with the Word. The Word is what you need, and then those supporting things that help affirm the Word is fine, but don't go to the weird places. Father, in Jesus' name, help us, Lord, to maintain our balance. And Lord, I pray for Dr. Robinson's voice. Lord, it's one of her most important gifts as a teacher. And Lord, I pray that her voice would begin to clear, her lungs would begin to cl completely clear, and she'd be able to speak as normal in Jesus' name. And Father, we just thank you for uh, what you're doing tonight, what you're doing in us. And Lord, help us to be ready as we approach this weekend.
to make preparation for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, and see you on Sunday. Yes, uh, this Friday, Taste of the Nations, if you like food, this Friday is your hookup. What time does it start, Tim? 7 o'clock. Get your eat on. Amen.